This video is sponsored by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence. 10 years since I uploaded my very first YouTube video. And so the lion fell in love with the lamb, he murmured. We accept the love we think we deserve. If people were rain, I was a drizzle and she was a hurricane. Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Today we're going to be doing a reading vlog, a very nostalgic sort of reading vlog. My 10 year anniversary for when I created this YouTube channel is very quickly approaching. I should have double checked before I started filming. March 30th, I created this account on March 30th, 2013. And very soon after that, I uploaded my very first video to this channel. It was a painting video and I was in high school at the time. I didn't start actively posting to this channel until I think around 2016, after we took our first trip to Japan. But regardless, I uploaded my very first video almost 10 years ago and I created my channel 10 years ago. And that makes me feel odd and uncomfortable. And so in order to celebrate that, I thought we would do a reading vlog where I reread my favorite books from around that time. Now, I've got three books I want to read in this video. The first is Twilight by Stephanie Meyer. There is such a complex history I have with this book, which I will explain in detail in a minute. I'm also going to read The Perks of Being a Wallflower by Stephen Chbosky. And then I'm also going to be reading Looking for Alaska by John Green, which I don't have at hand hand right now because it's in storage. I need to go fish it out. It's a very rainy, cozy day today. It is the perfect day to pick up Twilight and to start rereading this guy. I'm actually really excited. I should let you know at the beginning of this video that there will be mild spoilers for these books throughout the video. I've done my best to be vague, but I will allude to the things that happen. This is your warning. Watch at your own peril. Originally published in 2005, Twilight is a young adult paranormal romance novel about a 16 year old girl whose name is Bella who falls in love with a vampire whose name is Edward. It is the first in a four book series that's set in Forks, Washington State. The first film came out in 2008. I was 12 and this movie will forever be iconic, not only for having possibly the film industry's bluest color grading ever, but also the most consistent disdain of a lead actor. Did your Twilight experience turn out to be what you expected. It wasn't, it was like it was a book that wasn't supposed to be published. Uh, almost heartbreaking because they don't want it to be over. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a little bittersweet, isn't it? Um, for them. <laughs> yeah. And as well, such a shockingly good spread of music across the franchise that I still unironically listen to the New Moon soundtrack today. In the Olympic Peninsula of Northwest Washington State, a small town named Forks exists under a near constant cover of clouds. It rains on this inconsequential town more than any other place in the United States of America. So the context in which I was originally reading this, I think I was 14? I borrowed this book from a friend of mine because this book was not at our school library. Even though it was like a public school, like I don't see why a public school wouldn't have this. But anyway, reading the first page of the first chapter. Oh God, it's so nostalgic. <laughs> But it was sure to be awkward with Charlie. Neither of us was what anyone would call verbose. Like what 16 year old uses the word verbose? <laughs> I know that Bella is basically the caricature, the not like other girls girl. I've always been slender, but soft somehow. And then it goes on to like describe how clumsy she is and, and, and describing all of these metrics, which are still within the bounds of conventional beauty, but she doesn't think she's beautiful. It is funny to read it now with the eyes of an adult. 
Which one is the boy with the reddish brown hair? I asked. That's Edward. He's gorgeous, of course, but don't waste your time. He doesn't date. Apparently none of the girls here are good looking enough for him. She sniffed, a clear case of sour grapes. I wondered when he turned her down. I bit my lip to hide a smile. Then I glanced at him again. His face was turned away, but I thought his cheek appeared lifted as if he was smiling too. <laughs> Hello. Today is Monday. I have a very, very busy work day today. It's a little bit stressful, but I am right now on my lunch break. Look at that work-life balance. I'm gonna eat my lunch and then read some more of Twilight. This is how far I got into the book. I have read loads. Today's eclectic bookmark is a post-it note. I'm currently up to chapter 13. I stopped myself right before I got to the bit where they get to the meadow and I'm very, very excited. I am tearing through this book. I'm having such a good time. On the one hand, I can see the things that are kind of deeply problematic about it in terms of Edward being controlling and being a stalker and the fact that we know that he's watching her while she's sleeping, the fact that he reacts in anger and aggression whenever he's scared for her, like all these things. I'm up to page 228. And we are going to read a little bit more of this book. The fact that he's sparkly is just so silly. Like, I love it, but it's, it's, it's ridiculous. He lay perfectly still on the grass, his shirt open over his sculpted incandescent chest, his scintillating arms bare, his glistening pale lavender lids were shut, though of course he didn't sleep. A perfect statue carved in some unknown stone, smooth like marble, glittering like crystal. He's talking about the fact that he tries so hard to avoid Bella. He could have just left. Like He didn't have to be there. He didn't have to stay in the classroom. He could have just said, I'm not feeling well. I'm going to go home. Oh, okay. So fair enough. He did just mention that he drove to Alaska, but then he got mad about the fact that he got chased away from his home. But I still retain the fact that he's a hundred years old and he doesn't need to be in high school. <laughs> You already know how I feel, of course, I finally said. I'm here, which roughly translated means I would rather die than stay away from you. I frowned. I'm an idiot. You are an idiot. You agreed with a laugh. It's pretty harsh. <laughs> Our eyes met and I laughed too. We laughed together at the idiocy and sheer impossibility of such a moment. And so the lion fell in love with the lamb, he murmured. I looked away, hiding my eyes. What a stupid lamb, I sighed. What a sick, masochistic lion, he said into the shadowy forest for a long moment. I wondered where his thoughts had taken him. I'm all finished reading Twilight now. I'm gonna share my thoughts with you guys, but right before we do that, I just wanted to thank the sponsor of this video, which is Squarespace. Squarespace is a website builder which allows people to create beautiful websites with ease. You guys are well and truly familiar by now with the fact that I made my website through Squarespace. I love my site so much. I loved building it and I couldn't be happier with how quick and simple it was to put together. Squarespace has loads of benefits which make it easy to show off the things that you make and connect with the people who have visited Visiting your site. Squarespace has powerful blogging tools so you can categorize, share, and schedule posts. And it also has wonderful analytics features to help you understand the people who are visiting your website. If you're looking to make a website, head to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash Christy Ann Jones to save 10% off your purchase of a website or domain. Today is now officially Friday. It has been 10 years since I uploaded my very first YouTube video. It just feels very, very strange. I finished this book and I'm gonna be speaking about it while I make some lemon and, no, not lemon. We've made a lot of lemon and poppy seed muffins on this channel. I'm gonna be making some cinnamon apple, apple and cinnamon tea cake muffins to celebrate the like 10th birthday of my channel. I'm gonna place this very carefully out the way because it's a library book. It needs to be protected. It needs to be far away from the baking. <laughs> this is such a simple recipe and I love it to bits and I'm gonna link it in the description down below. Okay, so butter, sugar, egg, Vanilla. Let's start with the butter. Ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> Two teaspoons of vanilla extract. We're gonna eyeball it because I cannot be bothered walking back to the drawer. So, Twilight, reading it as a 27 year old, I can clearly see a lot of the problems 
that the book has, but it was a really fun reading experience. I read it purely for self-indulgent nostalgia. No, the characters didn't feel real. Like, yes, I giggled most of the way through. There were a lot of problems here and there with the characterization or with different aspects of the book. Honestly, I enjoyed it so much. I do think that the first half of the book is a lot better than the second half. For me, the second that we get past the baseball scene, that really iconic scene in the movies, the book starts going downhill. It's like, it's the same quality the whole way through but my interest in the story just like plummets. Okay we just added half the milk and half the flour and now I'm going to mix. I mentioned at the beginning of this video that I have quite a complex relationship with Twilight. When I first read it when I was like 14 I really enjoyed the book but by the time I was about 16 so maybe like two years later yeah 14 plus 2 is 16. I hated it. I hated Twilight. I was very much I was very much in this period of my life where I didn't like the colour pink and I wore black nail polish every day and I, I didn't like things that were typically girly and I just decided that I didn't like Twilight. I didn't think Bella was a good protagonist because I don't think I really understood the nuance of what makes a good female protagonist. I thought what made a good female protagonist was one that was really strong and fierce and that there was only one way to be a strong female protagonist. I remember writing an essay when I was in year 11 comparing Katniss from The Hunger Games to Bella from Twilight and that was like one of my English essays and I spoke specifically about why <laughs> Katniss is a good female protagonist and why Bella isn't. Since then, have learnt quite a few things, have, have grown a greater understanding of nuance, and I've healed this part of myself that revolts away from things that are typically effeminate. And I, I suppose it's quite interesting because I'm, I'm quite an effeminate person, but I did have this really strong part of my personality where I hated specific kinds of girly things. I couldn't stand very specific kinds of girly things. I'm just, I suppose I'm really grateful to now be 27 years old, listening to Taylor Swift again, happy to be the person that I am and not worried if people think that I'm silly because I'm effeminate and not worried about liking the color pink because it's girly and you're not stupid for like listening to pop music and all of this stuff and it was just it was quite an experience but anyway Twilight suffered because of this experience that I went through and I thought that I hated it for a long time. It needs a little bit more milk because the xanthan gum which is what I put in to be a binding agent because this is gluten-free flour has made it a little bit too sticky. Slicing some apple to go on top of the muffins. So I suppose my final thoughts on Twilight are this. I enjoyed the experience of rereading it as an adult, but if I read the book now, if I didn't have any of the nostalgia, I don't think I'd enjoy it. However, as I said, I did enjoy the experience. It was a bit of fun, and although I see a lot of problems with the story, it was quite a fun time to go back and read it. I'm excited to get started with our next book, which is The Perks of Being a Wallflower. I didn't have a complex relationship with that book. There's never been a moment where I haven't loved that book. anniversary slash birthday to my YouTube channel. The Perks of Being a Wallflower is a young adult contemporary novel about a 15 year old boy whose name is Charlie. Charlie is in his first year of high school and at the beginning of the school year he's grappling with the sudden death of his friend Michael. The book is an epistolary novel which means that it's set in letters and Charlie is writing these letters to an anonymous friend. I'm already stuffing on the very first line of this. So it starts off with August 25, 1991. Dear friend, I'm writing to you because she said you listen and understand and didn't try to sleep with that person at that party even though you could have. Please don't try to figure out who she is because then you might figure out who I am and I really don't want you to do that. I'll call people by different names, blah 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 blah. Charlie is writing this to an anonymous person. But just going back to that very first sentence, I'm writing to you because she said you listen and understand and didn't try to sleep with that person at that party even though you could have. Once, once you know, <laughs> once you know what happens in this book, that first line becomes really significant and really meaningful and just reading that I'm already like, oh my heart. So this is my life. 
and I want you to know that I'm both happy and sad and I'm still trying to figure out how that could be. Page 10 and there's this bit where Charlie's talking about a boy who made a mixtape for his older sister and the mixtape included the song Asleep by the Smiths. That's so nostalgic for me because around this time, maybe a couple years before this, I watched 500 Days of Summer for the first time and that's my favorite movie. I said I love the Smiths. You have good taste in music. Like the Smiths? Yeah. To die by your side is such a heavenly way to die. I love them. So I started listening to them as a result of 500 Days of Summer and then I was on Tumblr a lot during this time and so this book and this like aesthetic of, of listening to the Smiths and, and, and just the vibe of this book, oh it's oh. I loved this book when I was a teenager. It's really well written. I love Charlie's voice in this. I love the sort of stilted awkwardness that makes it feel as if it was genuinely written by a 15 year old. Of course, because I've read the book before, I know the thing that happens at the end of this story and it's devastating. It was just such a gut punch and knowing that and reading through, I can see how sad the book is in a very genuine, subtle, soft way and not an over-the-top self-indulgent way. It's just very gently sad, very gently forlorn. Um, and if you've heard the song Asleep by the Smiths, it kind of feeds into this this gentle, sad vibe. And it's the, the book is beautiful and I'm really liking the voice of it so far. I didn't realize this this line was so early in the book. Okay, I'm on page 24 and Charlie is speaking with his English teacher. The book, you know, only 24 pages in has already had significant themes of abuse and, and people trying to be loved and some really heavy topics. As I said, I think they're beautifully done in this book, but it got to this line from the English teacher that I love so much and it just kind of gut punched me that it was right there. The, the line is like one of the most famous quotes from this book, which is, Charlie, we accept the love we think we deserve. And I, oh, <laughs> I love that line so much. I love it. I love it to absolute bits because it's, it is so very true. I'm up to page 70 at the moment. I am absolutely flying through this book and I think I'm really easily gonna finish it tonight because it's only just over 200 pages and I'm already up to page 70. I just got to this bit that was really nostalgic and it's when Charlie has this whole poem that he shares, a poem that he shared at a party with his friends. Yeah, I just got really emotional reading that because I, God, I loved this poem. And again, back on the Tumblr topic, I reblogged this poem just on its own a whole bunch of times. I feel like reading Twilight was a really fun, indulgent time, but I feel like this is a more emotional, nostalgic time because I feel for Charlie so very much. I have been absolutely flying through this book. I've read it so quickly. There are so many passages that are just beautifully written and the style, as I mentioned, I really like. I think the voice is so strong and I haven't gotten to the to the bad bit yet. I haven't gotten to the bit that I know made me cry the first time I read this. And I, I don't think I'm gonna have that response this time, but I, I figured I might as well film me reading the last bit of this book because I know it caused a really strong reaction in me when I was 16 reading it for the first time. So here we are reading the end of The Perks of Being a Wallflower. God, I love this book. Like this this reading vlog, I'm so glad I'm doing it because it's really affirmed how much I love this book and how important it was to me when I was a teenager. <laughs> She was sad though, but it was a hopeful kind of sad, the kind of sad that just takes time. <laughs> I love this book. I love it so much, but my god, that ending is... 
it is beautifully handled. A really, really heavy topic is beautifully handled. And it's just, it feels very honest and it's so powerful and so emotional. And I think that this is probably one of my favorite YA books ever. It's, it's, I, off the top of my head couldn't tell you what my favorite YA is, but I think this is up there pretty highly. I feel exhausted now. But the thing is that this book is quite short. It's very petite, it's a very small read, so it's only taking me a few hours to read through this whole book. I think I'm actually gonna start reading Looking for Alaska now. I pulled that book out of storage. I almost don't even want to feel my feelings. I just wanna dive into the next book. And that kind of happens sometimes for me when I read a short book because I'm surprised when it ends, so I just pick up a second book and start reading. Looking for Alaska by John Green is the next book and the final book we're gonna read. Looking for Alaska, which was published in 2005, was John Green's debut novel. It's about a young man whose name is Miles, he's nicknamed Pudge, he's from Florida, and he ends up going to a boarding school in Alabama, where he meets an enigmatic and spellbinding girl named Alaska. The book gripples with... <laughs> <laughs> grapples is not a word. The, <laughs> the book grapples. The book grapples with themes of love, loss, grief, and last words. <laughs> I might get this finished tonight, but I'm not sure. It's not that late yet. And if this is as quick to read as this book was, it's probably only gonna take me like four hours-ish. Not super duper long to read this book. Where are my glasses? <laughs> book number three. I am already up to page 40 on this book. I've read a small chunk of it, almost a quarter of it, because this book is also only around 200 pages. I like structurally what John Green does in this book. Every chapter is counting down to something and you don't know what that something is. So I think it starts with like 136 days before and then each chapter counts down a little bit more. And I remember feeling really anxious about that the first time I read it. The Perks of Being a Wallflower has aged so beautifully. Like it's, there's obviously stuff in there that I don't think would necessarily be written the same way if it came out today, but it's aged really, really well. However, there are parts of this book that have not aged very well at all. We're in the story, we've met Alaska, this girl that the main character becomes obsessed with, and it's really interesting because Alaska in this book is sort of known and described as one of the first and most significant examples of a manic pixie dream girl. This is such an interesting archetype of character that doesn't really get spoken about as much anymore, or at least doesn't maybe get depicted as much anymore, but I mentioned 500 Days of Summer. Summer gets described as a manic pixie dream girl, but the thing about that movie is that that whole movie is about listening to people and not letting yourself run away with your dreams of what people are, and Summer is supposed to be the anti-manic pixie dream girl because that's the point of the film. In the same way that I was able to read Twilight with a lot more nuance the second time around, I feel like I'm also able to read this book with a lot more nuance. I don't know if she's a manic pixie dream girl because I think that she's just a flawed and dysfunctional teenager who is perceived as being really attractive by the male main character, right? Because Pudge, or Miles, his nickname is Pudge, is the focalizer of this story. Everything in this story we're seeing through his eyes and his perspective because he is a 16 year old boy who is heterosexual and is in love with Alaska. He's perceiving her in a very, very specific way. But if you read the book, if you read what she actually does, Alaska actively rejects him. There's a scene where she's quite rude and dismissive of something bad that happens to him. And she's not very pleasant at all. Like, she's not very likable. But Pudge latches onto her because she's pretty and he's attracted to her. But I think it's a realistic depiction of this kind of teenage boy's obsession and worship with the idea of a girl but not the girl herself and I can see sort of gently how John Green is trying to do this. I'm only less than 50 pages in so far so I'll let you guys know how I feel about it but I don't know if it's fair to say that Alaska is a true manic pixie however if Alaska isn't and Summer isn't and they're it, like half of the stories about manic pixie dream girls are the antithesis of this idea but a lot of people misinterpret it and so they just pile those women in with the other man it just it's it's an interesting thing I've watched a lot of video essays on this topic reading it very quickly am I vibing with it as much as the other two no which is interesting so as I mentioned earlier every chapter in this book is counting down 
to something specific that's going to happen. I just got to the bit where the big thing happens, the thing that I obviously remembered very strongly from when I read it. I am so surprised that there's still so much of the book to go. I'm sort of sitting here being like, what else happens in this book? I remember the things leading up to the thing. I don't remember the things after the thing. This is my cryptic attempt at trying not to spoil things while referencing things directly so that the people who have read it know what I'm talking about. I did actually want to share a quote from page 88 because that stood out in my memory really strongly. Just like that, from a hundred miles an hour to a sleep in a nanosecond, I wanted so badly to lie down next to her on the couch, da 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 da, but I lacked the courage and she had a boyfriend and I was gawky and she was gorgeous and I was hopelessly boring and she was endlessly fascinating. So I walked back to my room and collapsed on the bottom bunk thinking that if people were rain, I was a drizzle and she was a hurricane. I am all finished with reading Looking for Alaska by John Green. I kind of just buckled down and wanted to get through the story of this one, mostly because I wasn't enjoying it quite as much as the perks of being a wallflower. I loved every moment of this, whereas for me as an adult reader, I felt like a lot of the story dragged, which is fascinating because I loved these books equally when I was a teenager. Like the quality level was the same. They were both equally tear jerking for me. I remember crying the first time I read this book. Second time around, didn't cry at all. Didn't even really feel that strong of an emotion. I stand by what I said earlier about the Manic Pixie Dream Girl. I don't know if that's fair. I know that John Green gets criticized a lot for, or at least I've, in certain areas of the internet, I've seen John Green be criticized before for his depiction of teenage girls and the way that his male protagonists perceive them. I I think that the way Pudge sees Alaska in this book, I think it's honest. I think that it is a patriarchal lens through which he sees her. And I think that it's a little bit ironic that for a book that mentions the patriarchy as much as this book does, there are certain like very specific gender roles. The word bitch is used like an uncomfortable amount to me. Like it, it was really jarring for me to, to hear these teenage boys say that so consistently about a lot of the female characters. And I think if John Green wrote this book now, he wouldn't do that at all. I still think this is a really solid book and that it explores a lot of really important themes. As I I mentioned earlier the main character of this story has an obsession with last words and so the final sentence of this book is Thomas Edison's last words were it's very beautiful over there I don't know where there is but I believe it's somewhere and I hope it's beautiful and oh again another tumblr quote I used to reblog so much so overall how did I find the rereading of these three books I think it was a really fun experiment and I really encourage you guys to try this out if you're interested in it taking a look 10 years ago at the books that were your favorite books and giving them a reread and seeing how you feel about them now and maybe the way you feel about them has changed. My favorite book I read by far was The Perks of Being a Wallflower. I think this book is brilliant. It definitely stands the test of time. It was harrowing and beautiful. I love the way it's written. I love Charlie. I, oh, oh that, that, that boy. Poor, vulnerable, earnest. Charlie. Looking for Alaska, some bits were a bit jarringly out of date. I didn't find it quite as engaging as I thought I was going to find it. Perks of Being a Wallflower is probably a five star book for me. This is probably a three star book for me now, come to think of it. Twilight. I had a fun time. So I'd probably give this book four stars just based entirely on how much fun I had reading this. I hope you guys enjoyed this very nostalgic reading vlog. Thank you for watching and also an enormous thank you to everyone over on Patreon for supporting my channel over on Patreon. We have a whole bunch of bonus content, bonus videos, our book club, and lots of other stuff. So if you're interested in checking out Patreon, there's a link in the description down below. Take care, everyone, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.